The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, good evening, and welcome to this webinar on glucocorticoid-induced osteoporosis, the science and the therapy. In these days when online meetings remain the only possible option, I, Dominique Piero, science manager at IOF, I'm very happy to moderate this webinar. Before introducing the speaker of the day, I would like to inform you that attendees are automatically muted. I also would like to encourage you to ask questions during the webinar by typing your questions into the question box of the GoToWebinar control panel. I will voice the questions to the speaker towards the end of this webinar. This being said, I'm very happy to introduce our speaker of the day, Professor Nancy Lane. Professor Lane is Distinguished Professor of Medicine and Rheumatology at the University of California at Davis School of Medicine in Sacramento. She is a member of the National Academy of Medicine in the U.S. and a member of the Committee of Scientific Ad Advisor for IOF. She has extensively published on this topic of glucocorticoid-induced osteoporosis. Professor Lane, please, we are listening to your presentation. Uh, thank you, Dominique, and welcome everyone to um, our discussion on glucocorticoid-induced osteoporosis. This morning, I will discuss the work that's been done in our laboratory and others to better define the science and then get along to the therapy and then how best to screen and identify our patients that need treatment. As most of you know, glucocorticoid-induced osteoporosis is the most common cause of secondary osteoporosis. And what makes it so important is it occurs at any age in both males and females and across all ethnic groups. And unfortunately, 30 to 50% of patients on glucocorticoids sustain an osteoporotic fracture. Since these agents are used so commonly across so many um, specialties of medicine, pulmonary, rheumatology, gastroenterology, transplantation, skin and neurologic diseases, it's something that many physicians need to know more about. Now, it used to be that we thought that there was a safe dose of a glucocorticoid that you could give, say, prednisone less than five milligrams a day, and a patient's bones would be protected. And that is not the case. Starting as low as about three milligrams of prednisone a day, there is an increased risk of spinal fractures. So very few patients on chronic long-term therapy, even low doses, have sparing of their skeleton. Now, another thing that makes glucocorticoid-induced osteoporosis so interesting is it is very, actually quite different than postmenopausal osteoporosis and age-related osteoporosis. And I'll be showing you that a bit as we go along this morning. But I wanted to show this radiograph where you can all see that there's what we call a midline fracture in the middle of this vertebrae. And this is a 40-year-old patient on glucocorticoids. And it, this fracture is something we see with glucocorticoids right in the middle of the vertebrae. And it's different than that anterior wedge fracture so commonly seen in women with postmenopausal osteoporosis. So one has to ask yourself, what happens to bone that makes it so soft? And Harvey Cushing, a famous scientist in the United States in 1932 while investigating Cushing syndrome commented, the very compressed bodies of the vertebrae were so soft they could be cut with a knife. So basically glucocorticoids soften bone, they turn it to butter, and that's a journey that we're going to investigate a little bit this morning. Besides the bone turning soft, as was shown many years ago by Lon and colleagues studying patients with rheumatoid arthritis, the bone loss from glucocorticoids is rapid. He put 
rheumatoid arthritis patients on 10 milligrams a day of prednisone, and within less than six months, they had lost 8% of their lumbar spine trabecular bone. But what made this so interesting is when the glucocorticoid or prednisone was taken away, you see there is recovery of some of the bone loss, not completely. And again, that is different than in the postmenopausal or age-related state. So when you look at what happens to the bone structure in glucocorticoids, nicely shown by David Dempster years ago, that there is both a thinning of the trabeculae and a dropout of the trabeculae, such that this adds, we think, to the bone becoming more fragile. But a th something that is important to realize and shown so nicely by Van Stat a number of years ago, looking at postmenopausal women with osteoporosis and patients on glucocorticoids for one year, the yellow boxes are fractures on glucocorticoid patients, the white boxes are fractures in postmenopausal osteoporosis. And you see a little bit in the spine and even more in the hip that patients on glucocorticoids fracture at what we would call normal or actually mildly abnormal BMDs. So there you go. The glucocorticoids make bone very fragile and the bone strength is reduced at normal bone densities. That observation led our laboratory years ago to begin to study a little more about the biology of glucocorticoid-induced osteoporosis. And with my colleagues, Dr. Yao, we did a study where we gave mice glucocorticoids and measured their bone mineral density. And you can see in the spine and in areas rich in trabecular bone, within 28 days of the glucocorticoid starting, you had a significant reduction in trabecular bone volume. But after that, it was it did not return to normal with continued use, but the rate slowed down. When we looked at the gene expression in the bone, we could see very quickly that genes associated with osteoclast activation and bone resorption were upregulated by day seven. That went along with the bone turnover marker, CTX, shown in the glucocorticoids in yellow versus placebo, that there was also a very a rapid increase in that CTX osteoclast marker of bone resorption within seven days, maintained to day 28, but then came down to about the placebo rate by day 56. Now, that was different than bone formation or osteoblast activity. You can see that at day seven, there was not much reduction in osteocalcin, but by day 28, it was markedly reduced and, may, and stayed reduced through day 56. Um, bone histomorphometry also showed reduction in um, tetracycline label consistent with reduced osteoblast activity. Then we went further looking at, gene, at the gene expressions in a microwave and you can see here that we found uh, very quickly in the red, showing increased gene expression of WINT inhibiting proteins. Now, this was a number of years ago before we knew what we know today, but you can clearly see that DKK1 and sclerostin, inhibitors of osteoblast maturation and activity through the WINT pathway, those inhibitors were increased in the presence of glucocorticoids, suggesting an effect here. We showed that the glucocorticoid excess saw rapid increases in gene expression for osteoclast activation and bone resorption and prolonged suppression of bone formation, which appeared to be um, associated with increased expression of these WINT inhibitors, resulting in rapid trabecular bone loss. Now, the clinical observation is that patients with glucocorticoid excess fracture at higher bone densities than postmenopausal with women with osteoporosis.
And that still bothered us. So we went back to the microarray and we looked at it a little more carefully and we all and saw that not only did we have increased Wnt inhibitor proteins being made to reduce osteoblast activity, but we also had an increase in osteocytic genes, including DMP and also sclerostin, which made us then begin to think that there was something happening in the osteocyte uh, with um, the presence of glucocorticoids. So with the with the help of with the help of scientists at the Lawrence Berkeley lab and UCSF engineers we started down a journey of performing atomic force microscopy with nano indentation and what you're seeing here is um, on the left hand of your screen is a, a mouse femur and that is a, a reconstructed view of the AFM and the bright color means high numbers and the dark colors mean low and then you see the sizes of the osteocytes what you see in the placebo treated mice this is from our same experiment out at 56 days uh, the size of the uh, osteocyte and then you see kind of for the most part bright colors and then as you move down to the left you see a mouse of the same age that had had undergone an ovariectomy, and you can see that the osteocyte lacunae are a little larger, and there's more dark areas, i.e., where there's probably less mineral and less strength on the edges of the trabeculae where remodeling is going on. And then if you move to the right, you see something very different. You see larger osteocyte lacunae, and you see areas of dark, which is low elastic modulus, inside the trabeculae itself. And lastly, you see an area next to the osteocyte where it's dark and then it's bright, like there's a halo around it. And we were quite impressed by this and went to the literature. Well, first of all, we said mice are not men or women. So we were lucky to obtain some human biopsy samples, some iliac crest biopsy samples, and we saw that this was also happening clinically in patients on glucocorticoids. They had areas around their osteocytes that had decreased elastic modulus, and as we went on to show, decreased mineral. So we then went to the literature, and we found an entity called osteocytic osteolysis. Now, osteocytes are buried in the matrix, and it turns out their lacunae can change in size with clinical calcium deficits. We've seen it reported now with hypophosphatemic rickets, glucocorticoids during lactation and prolonged estrogen deficiency. Now, we haven't exactly figured it out yet, but the, it's been brought up the osteoclast surface. That may not be sufficient to maintain calcium balance in certain disease states. And there's evidence, even more now than before, that osteocytes can express metalloproteinase metalloproteinases and um, they may then slowly resorb their matrix and contribute to calcium phosphorus homeostasis. Now we thought about this and then we were very lucky for some additional research to be done by John Wiselmelski and Linda Bonewald where they looked at mice not on glucocorticoids per se but during lactation and they looked at the cortical bone area um, in, uh, and looked at osteocyte size in normal mice, in mice that were undergoing, were lactating, and then they looked after lactation in some mice, and you can see that the osteocyte lacunae size changed based on that metabolic state, supporting the fact that osteocytes can engage in a form of resorbing mineral and releasing calcium. And then the question then is, well, that's nice. How does that relate to any of the bone strength in the presence of glucocorticoids or for that matter, lactation? And then Laura Teddy and some other people, Anna Teddy and some other people nicely showed, produced a, um, a concept that 
osteocytes in a resting state can demineralize and then when the stress goes away say of glucocorticoids they can remineralize but if they don't remineralize those large osteocyte lacunae could result in weakening the bone and increasing the risk for fragility fractures okay now i'm going to leave the ostracides for a minute and talk a little bit about work that our research group has been doing over the last few years. It's not particularly related to glucocorticoid induced osteoporosis, but more trying to understand a little bit about glucocorticoid induced osteonecrosis. And to do this work, we actually started doing sodium fluoride PET scanning of the tibia and femurs of mice. And you can see in the up, upper corner the actual scans or representation of the scans and where we look for our, um, our sodium fluoride marker. And then you can see up in the left-hand side what happens when we give the mice glucocorticoids for six weeks. They have reduction in blood flow. And it turns out that in this particular study, PTH, was able to prevent that loss of bone blood flow. And then if you look down into the middle of the slide, you will see we did microfill and looked at blood vessel density. And you can see that the mice on glucocorticoids had reduced blood vessel density and blood vessel thickness, as nicely shown in the figure on your right. And that interestingly, PTH, appeared not only to prevent the loss in bone density, but in this mice actually increase it. We also were testing a hybrid compound, LLP2A alendronate, because it brings stem cells to the bone surface, which are also stem cells can be angiogenic. And we also saw some evidence of that. But it brought up the aspect that glucocorticoids, besides changing bone metabolism, appear to have an effect on vascularity. We went a little further with this with the help of Sue Cao and his laboratory at Johns Hopkins, and we treated mice for 60 days or 120 days with glucocorticoids. And in one group, after 60 days, we then stopped the glucocorticoid to look at recovery, and in another group, we gave glucocorticoid for 60 days and then anti-VEGF. And what you can clearly see here, looking at immunohistochemistry, is that after 60 days, glucocorticoids significantly reduced the H vessels in the, um, in the metaphysis of the femur, 120 days also, but that if you stop the glucocorticoid, it appears that some of these vessels returned. And a little further work, that has not been yet finished is, we looked at the bones and looked at gene expression for angiogenesis. And you can see that when you compared the glucocorticoid to placebo, there was reduction in angiogenesis genes and also nitric oxide. But if you gave PTH concurrently compared to GC, it appeared to reduce this. So we will talk about the treatment of glucocorticoid-induced osteoporosis with PTH, and maybe these are through angiogenesis and reversal of nitric oxide um, production, it is how some of the ways this agent may be working for the treatment of glucocorticoid induced osteoporosis. We also started have started investigating in our laboratory bone hydration. Um, we all think as we get older that the bone dries out and becomes, as I say, potentially brittle, but we have not been able to measure that very well. However, work with um, Jeff Nyman at Vanderbilt University using the same experimental design as I mentioned showed that the bound water of cortical bone goes down with 60 and 120 days of glucocorticoids. And while that by itself is not terribly important. When you look at the bound water relationship to the bending strength of the mouse femur, you see quite a high and significant correlation. When you add it all together and look at bone strength, when you add the uh, bone hydration and cortical thickness, 
it is quite a, explains quite a bit of the bone strength in the presence of um, glucocorticoids and without it, suggesting that bone hydration, possibly through the, vas uh, the bone vasculature, may be one of those bone qualities that we helps explain why patients on glucocorticoids fracture at higher bone densities, their bone may be just dry. Okay. Now, I want to leave our research and talk a little bit more about the translational work that's been done to support the therapies we use for the treatment and prevention of osteoporosis. In our laboratory, Dr. Yao nicely showed that when you gave the mice 28 days of glucocorticoids and then you treated them with either residronate, a bisphosphonate, or PTH, you had an improvement or a restoration, if you will, of the trabecular bone loss with the glucocorticoids. And that supports what we do in the clinic. However, we were interested to see how these two agents worked. And, it, and you can see here, what was interesting was glucocorticoids, as we know, inhibit or activate Wnt signaling inhibitors, reducing osteoblast maturation. PTH appears to reverse that, increasing bone formation. But the bisphosphonates, as in this case, residronate, as shown in the right lower uh, part of this slide here, shows that the glucocorticoids inhibit mineralization genes, but, but the residronate or the bisphosphonate appeared to stimulate them, thereby stimulating mineralization of the bone, which also would increase bone mass and bone strength. So by two different mechanisms, we've nicely shown how these two types of agents probably are working. Now I wanna to switch to patients and the treatment of steroid-induced osteoporosis. And a study done by Lenore Buckley years ago asked physicians the top three side effects of glucocorticoids. And interestingly, 75% of them thought that osteoporosis was a big problem in postmenopausal women on steroids, but only 25% of them thought it was a problem in premenopausal women or 45-year-old men. And sadly, this study continues to be done many, many times and very similar uh, results come out. We haven't seemed to train physicians that everyone on steroids is at risk of bone loss and fracture. So now we're going to start to talk about treatment. I want to remind you all that glucocorticoids, besides reducing osteoblast activity, and increasing osteoclast activity through a number of different mechanisms. Glucocorticoids also can cause a negative calcium balance through reduction in the GI absorption of calcium and increase in the urinary excretion of calcium. So when we begin to think about treating our patients, I always like people to remember that calcium and vitamin D needs to be replaced. Vitamin D should be replaced so that the 25D is above 30, and calcium should be given appropriate for the age and sex of the patient. But as Lenore Buckley showed many years ago, in patients on low doses of prednisone, um, chronic stably, most of the patients with rheumatoid arthritis, even a little bit of calcium and vitamin D would maintain the bone mass compared to placebo in these patients. However, today, in addition to calcium and vitamin D supplementation, we would tend to think about preventing loss of bone mass in patients on steroids. And basically, all of the bisphosphonates we have approved for the treatment of osteoporosis have been shown to prevent bone loss in the spine and hip in patients that are on if you're just starting the glucocorticoid, preventing it. However, by far, the greatest effect of the bisphosphonates in patients are on patients that are on chronically on glucocorticoids, and all agents we have available today increase bone mass 
in the presence of glucocorticoids compared to placebo, which in this case is cal in addition to calcium and vitamin D, which is why we use these, these um, agents. And as important as bone mass, we all know the best measure of bone strength is fractures. And in all bisphosphonates we have available today, um, most of them maintain bone or increase bone mass, and most of them have been shown to reduce fracture risk in patients on glucocorticoids, which is why we use them for treatment. Now, as I mentioned earlier, our preclinical studies focused in on parathyroid hormone, an important hormone for the maintenance of calcium in our systems. However, PTH really does have a role in glucocorticoid-induced osteoporosis because glucocorticoids shorten osteoblast activity and lifespan, and PTH both stimulates osteoblast activity and there's some data to, that increases the number and potentially extends lifespan so, of osteoblasts. So there's a real reason that it may work in glucocorticoid or that does work. In glucocorticoid induced osteoporosis. Years ago, we did a study giving PTH in patients on steroids, postmenopausal women, and we could see early on they stimulated bone formation and later on resorption, as we know happens with this compound. One year of PTH in women that were postmenopausal on steroids had an increase in spine bone mass of 10 and QCT of 35%. So we could see that PTH can override the suppressive effects of glucocorticoids and stimulate new bone formation. Later, a larger study was done by Eli Lilly, reported by Ken Sag, where they compared patients that were um, on glucocorticoids to teriparatide or alendronate. And as you can see in the slide, they very nicely showed that teriparatide had a dramatic increase in bone mineral density of the spine and hip, and that it was greater than treatment with alendronate. And not surprisingly, patients that were on teriparatide and steroids had an increase in turnover of both osteoblast and osteoclast markers, while alendronate, as expected, would reduce both of those. But another endpoint in the study was fracture and vertebral fractures were about 6% in the alendronate group and less than about a half a percent in the teriparatide group, and that was significant. So in this group of patients, if you had patients that were on steroids and low bone mass risk of fracture, it looked like in this study, PTH was able to um, reduce fractures. However, today, our more recent uh, information on steroid-induced osteoporosis is treatment with denosumab. And a study that was reported about two years ago now in Lancet by Ken Sag and sponsored by Amgen, you can see that if you patients that were just, were chronically on glucocorticoids, they were given randomized erysidronate and denosumab over the course of a year, the group on denosumab and steroids had a greater increase in lumbar spine and total hip bone mass compared to the residronate group. If patients were just beginning steroids, you also saw over the course of six months and a year, greater gains in lumbar spine and hip bone mass in the group treated with denosumab versus residronate. And when you looked at the bone turnover markers, there was a greater reduction and rather rapidly within 10 days, of CTX in the denosumab treated group and also later on P1MP, but as expected, um, anyway, so supporting the uh, mechanism of action of denosumab. So denosumab has been approved for the treatment, prevention treatment of glucocorticoid induced bone loss. We remember we don't have fracture incidence between these two, we can't speak to that. And I just want to caution everyone that if a patient discontinues denosumab, even if they're no longer on glucocorticoids, they may still have rapid increase in bone turnover and may fracture. So they still may need 
an anti-resorptive agent for a few months, either orally or IV, until they um, come back into equilibrium there. That's a group we got to keep an eye on. Okay, so lastly, I just want to go over some of the um, American College of Rheumatology guideline for the prevention and treatment of glucocorticoid-induced osteoporosis. Um, the group did an amazing job. They used the GRADE methodology, and they pretty much centered on the group at highest risk for fractures and glucocorticoids were individuals that were over 40, especially if they'd had an osteoporotic fracture, if their bone mass was low. And they also said if the frax for hip fracture was greater than 1% or major osteoporotic greater than 20% or on very high glucocorticoids, that was a group that you're gonna to wanna to treat. And I'm gonna show you a little bit more about that, but I'm gonna mention that there was a recent, within the last two years, a kind of a reanalysis of how best to operationalize glucocorticoid-treated patients in the FRACs. And basically, to make the long story short, said that if you're on glucocorticoids, seven and a half milligrams a day or greater, you should increase your risk of fracture by frax about 15%. And that pretty much fit, fit, fits here with what the ACR guideline is, because you're saying if you have a hip risk of 10 year greater than 1% and you're on steroids, you should treat. So I think that um, it pretty much falls in line. So if you have those patients that are over 40 or under 40 and they're in the risk group, uh, the recommendation by the American College of Rheumatology was to treat with an oral bisphosphonate or calcium and vitamin D, or um, treat with an oral, the reason they went with the oral bisphosphonate was for cost and safety and the, a feeling there was lack of evidence for anti-fracture efficacy with the other osteoporosis medications. However, if a patient did not want to oral bisphosphonate, was at a higher risk profile, an IV infusion of a bisphosphonate would be great, and probably also denosumab would fit in that now, although it wasn't approved for the treatment or prevention of glucocorticoid-induced osteoporosis at the time that these um, recommendations were written. And they also mentioned teriparatide, and just to remember that um, they were weighing it against the cost and burden of the therapy with daily injections, but if a patient was um, indeed needing it, that, that that would be an appropriate treatment. So that's kind of the update on those uh, guidelines. So I think I'm gonna put this summary of glucocorticoid-induced osteoporosis and osteonecrosis together. It's just to remember that glucocorticoids rather rapidly cause osteoporosis, and they also are involved in osteonecrosis, as we're shown that it definitely reduces vascularity of bone. And the prevention of glucocorticoid-induced osteoporosis and possibly um, osteoporosis may actually require maintenance or regeneration of that bone vasculature because you need that for bone cells to actually, um, osteoblasts need, uh, they need nutrition and they need, so they need the vasculature to be able to um, form bone. And I think we need some additional studies still to determine if the changes in bone cell viability in the presence of GCs result from the direct toxicity of the cells or from compromised vasculature. And so there's a little bit more work to do as we try to figure out how best to treat our patients on glucocorticoids. And I wanna just take a moment, and this list is um, incomplete of all the wonderful people that have helped um, us do the research we have and better understand how to treat patients to preserve and reverse their bone deficits on steroids. And now I'm gonna open up our, um, I'm gonna thank you all for your attention and open up for any questions there may be. Thank you, thank you all very much. Thank you very much, Professor Lane, for your excellent talk and for covering glucocorticoid-induced osteoporosis. Thank you very much for reviewing the pathophysiology, the treatment options, and for highlighting the recent treatment guidelines. I'm sure it was greatly appreciated by our audience.
And now I would like to move on to questions as we have received a number of them during the presentation. So maybe the first question is, uh, what do you do about treatment for patient age 50 on glucocorticoids with normal bone mass? Um, I think that that's a great question. And um, if they haven't had fractures in normal bone mass, if the prednisone is, the steroids are gonna be greater than five milligrams a day for more than say six to eight weeks, I would give a bisphosphonate or denosumab treatment. Definitely. Because so much happens to the bone with glucocorticoids before the bone mass changes that I always think it's very important to be ahead of it. Thank you. I have another question. Uh, what do you propose for a patient who is on pregnison indefinitely and who has osteoporosis? Uh, definitely at the patient who's on prednisone and definitely in osteoporosis, my feeling you need a an agent that is going to reverse the osteoporosis and strengthen the bone in the presence of steroids, if possible, I would go with a PTH compound because that's one that's really going to increase the bone mass in the presence of the steroids and improve bone strength. And after that, after a two-year treatment, I would maintain treatment with an anti-resorptive agent. If the bone mass is still low, I would switch them to denosumab if the bone mass is okay. I would probably switch them to the either an IV or oral bisphosphonate, remembering that if they're on steroids, they're still going to remain at an increased risk of fracture. And if they're not on steroids anymore, but they still have low bone mass, then they're, we all know that treated osteoporosis is still osteoporosis. And last but not least, if you've given them teriparatide, they will lose their bone mass and bone strength quickly, so you want to be able to maintain it with an anti-resorptive agent. Thank you. That's a great question. Uh, yeah, there are many questions related to yeah the use of uh, therapy with uh, uh, long, lo lifelong steroid, steroid therapy. Another one, for example, um, is regarding when to start. Uh, can we start a bisphosphate? bisphosphonate in the same time of initiation of steroid, especially if we are considering a patient uh, who will continue all his life using steroid? Uh, yes, I think that's, that's very important to initiate it at the same time. Um, if you'll refer back to the American College of Rheumatology, the guidelines less than 40, greater than 40, if you get a bone density and there's a frax at all that shows like 1% risk for the hip and 10% for the um, major osteoporotic fracture, because of the additional bone fragility of steroids, uh, that steroids cause, that please start medication. It's better to begin the medication preventing the loss, pre preventing the fragility from occurring, and then stopping it, you know, when the steroids are stopped. That's, I think, where we get behind is we don't think about prevention. And one of the reasons we don't is I will start a patient on glucocorticoids in my clinic for a rheumatic disease and I'll think, oh, I'll have it all done in, in six to eight weeks and 90% of my patients are not off, medic, off the steroids then. So again, um, I, it, it's good to prevent it, the loss. Another one related to the long-term use of steroids. Uh, how would you balance the risks of long-term bisphosphonates? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, there, there are risks of long-term bisphosphonates. And I also want to mention, I didn't mention it in my talk, but when people have gone back and looked at the risk factors for subtrochanteric fractures, they find that 30% of the patients are on steroids. So whatever the cause of the subtroke fractures, the, the glucocorticoids appear not to be helpful. So, but on the other hand, you've got to balance the risk of the patient. So I would say 
I would back up the IOF and the ASBMR guidelines and say, if you have a patient on chronic glucocorticoids and chronic bisphosphonates, you should take a look at them every three, three years and reevaluate. The patients that are on glucocorticoids, even though they have normal bone densities, they still may be at risk for fracture. But what you can do <coughs> is you could cycle the patients and you could say, stop the bisphosphonate after say three to five years if it's necessary, you could give them teriparatide or abaloparatide for a year or two and then give them bisphosphonate again if they continue on chronic steroids. It's something you can't forget about because the longer they're on steroids, they're gonna have, even with relatively normal bone masses, a risk of fracture. So what I do is I tend to say if my patients are on chronic steroids and their T-scores of the spine or hip are below minus one, I still treat them. I may lower the doses a bit of the bisphosphonates to more of the prevention than the treatment mode, but I treat them. I don't stop my treatment. The treatment continues. Uh, another one related to the blood uh, and blood flow. Wouldn't these phosphonates exacerbate loss of blood flow in GIOP? Uh, that's a great question. The question is, would bisphosphonates reduce the blood flow in GIOP? Um, well, I don't, I don't, we don't know. We haven't truly um, studied a bisphosphonate by itself, um, but we have done a lot of work in uh, rodents and the and it, it doesn't look like it's too much of an inhibitor at least what we've looked at what's interesting is that when the rodents become estrogen deficient there's a lot of change in the um, blood flow quite significantly because estrogen is angiogenic and when we re remove the estrogen a lot reduction in blood flow but after that, the bisphosphonates, they didn't increase it, they didn't decrease it. They were kind of neutral, at least the doses we used. So it's a good question. So I'm assuming the doses we're using in our patients on GCs, that they probably aren't high enough to affect the blood flow. That's a very good question. And again, I would also say that we're probably not seeing much of that because if you think osteonecrosis, although it does occur in younger patients, um, we give bisphosphonates to patients on steroids. It appears to maintain the bone mass. We don't seem to have seen an epidemic or a bump in osteonecrosis. So I think we're probably okay in the doses we're using. It's a really good question and something always to think about, sure. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Somebody else is asking, uh, when do we need to repeat a DEXA scan in glucocorticoid-induced uh, osteoporosis patients? Yeah, it's another really good question. I think you can do it one year and one day after your baseline one because you're assessing therapy. So it just depends on your patient. I tend not to I tend to not get a lot of them. I tend to go every two years. But if you're concerned about the patient and you want to adjust therapies, then you can get it in a year and it'll give you some information. But just remember, this is kind of old school information that you got to know a little bit about the DEXA machine and be sure that the um, coefficient of variation is less than what you think the change is gonna be. So yeah. in the hip, you pretty much need a four to 5% change before it's a real change. So just be careful about that, that you're, because if it's less than that, you really don't know if it's your change from therapy or if it's the machine itself. So that's why I tend to go out a little longer if I can, thank you. Thank you. And now when related for, uh, to our U.S. audience, um, why do we have challenges in the U.S. with recognition by rheumatologists of uh, GIOP, GOIP? <laughs> yeah, that's a really great question. I, what uh, would um, you recommend to help change that perception? Well, um, I think that what's happened in the United States is rheumatologists are so busy. There's so few rheumatologists and they're so busy taking care of the biologics for all of the, um, the rheumatic diseases that osteoporosis just gets forgotten. And 
every time, but we, but unfortunately, endocrinologists are so busy taking care of um, diabetes that osteoporosis gets forgotten there too. So we really just have to continually remind people, especially rheumatologists, to own the bone and step up because it's our agents we're using to treat the diseases that are taking the bone away, and we just have to continue to remind people to have to just reflexly like they do we just have to continually remind people it's it's our mission i wish i had a better answer <laughs> thanks and maybe the final question uh would rumazosimab be effective to treat uh giop yeah it's a really good question um it's a it's a really good question i i i think so um because remember steroids reduce sclerostin well, steroids increase sclerostin and romazosumab would reduce it or reduce its activity. So we would get an increase in bone mass and strength. We did a study in our laboratory on that and it looked like romazosumab was effective in a, in a rodent model of, of glucocorticoids. So the answer is yes. And um, I think it would work. And um, We'll see over time if it's studied as an actual indication or we maybe we'll be able to give it off label. So very good question. But my basic answer is yes. And it may well well teriparatide is and is really good for um really, really good for um the spine, possibly, and this is off label, and I'm gonna be very careful when I say this because I'm not aware of any studies that have been done with romazosumab to treat steroid-induced osteoporosis, but it might be a good medication for our agent, our patients that have really low hip bone mass um, on steroids and increased risk of fracture. So we'll hopefully get there. It's a good question. Many thanks. And I think we'll, with this answer, we will conclude our Q&A session. And I would like to thank you very much for your participation in this webinar. And we hope that you enjoyed this session. We will post the recording of this webinar on the IWEP website, and you will also receive the link by email tomorrow. You will be prompted to fill in a survey immediately after this webinar. We would appreciate your input and comments as we continuously try to deliver webinars that meet your needs. And last, last but not the least, if you have any questions, comments, please do not hesitate to send them over to webinar at iofbonahealth.org. And now I would like to conclude by thanking uh, Professor Lane. This was really a very good uh, presentation with uh, very interesting questions. And I really thank you uh, for giving us this talk today. And I wish everybody a good day or a good evening. Goodbye to everybody. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Monique. <laughs> Dominique, we did it. <laughs> All right. Yes.